Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class from HowStuffWorks.com. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. We are coming up on the 100th anniversary of the Battle of Amiens, which started what came to be known as the 100 Days Offensive. That was the Allies' final push to win World War I. And this particular battle and the 100 Days Offensive aren't really talked about as frequently as some of the other big moments in World War I. All of our other World War I-related episodes are from much earlier in the war, a lot of the time because it was the 100th anniversary of that thing. So we're going to set the stage a little bit in this episode before we get to the battle itself, especially with how events that played out in 1917 led to all of this and how the Battle of Amiens ultimately led to the end of the war. Also, World War I was massive. There was a lot going on in other parts of the world during the time period that we're talking about. So we are really just focused on Europe here, particularly the Western Front, with the key players being the British Empire, France, the United States, and Germany. It is much too large to also talk about all of the other battles going on in all of the other places with all of the other countries in 1917 and 1918. So World War I started, of course, in 1914. Although international tensions had been rising in Europe for years before this point, things shifted with the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife Sophie. They were shot to death in Sarajevo on June 28, 1914, by Serbian nationalist Gavrilo Princip. The Archduke had been the heir to the throne of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. The Empire suspected that the Serbian government was involved in the assassination. So Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia, and soon much of Europe was involved in this conflict. Within two weeks, the allies of Russia, Belgium, France, and Great Britain had all sided with Serbia. Germany had sided with the Austro-Hungarian Empire as part of what would be called the Central Powers, and more declarations of war followed from there. This quickly became a war of attrition, with the war on land in Europe being fought primarily along the eastern and western fronts. Battles went on for months with millions of casualties and catastrophic effects for the civilian population, including famines and food shortages all over Europe. For most of it, the situation between the Allies and the Central Powers was essentially a stalemate. This was especially true along the Western Front, which ran from the English Channel to Switzerland, primarily through France. Something started to shift at the end of 1917, though. Russian involvement in the war had never been popular there, and the war had compounded ongoing economic problems and food shortages in Russia. The February Revolution started on March 8th of 1917. It's called the February Revolution because Russia was still on the Julian calendar, so from the Russian point of view, that was February. The February Revolution started with strikes and riots, and it led to the abdication of Tsar Nicholas II. Unrest continued after the February Revolution. The Bolshevik Revolution followed in November of 1917, and that was followed by the Russian Civil War. With all of this going on, Russian involvement in World War I effectively ended, and Russia signed an armistice with the Central Powers in December of 1917. A lot of the fighting along the Eastern Front at this point had been between Russia and Germany. So with Russia out of the picture, German forces were freed up to move to the Western Front instead. More than 40 divisions of German troops prepared to do exactly that after Russia withdrew from the war. The United States had also declared war on Germany in April of 1917. Although the U.S. had avoided becoming directly involved in the war until that point, it had been providing supplies and other aid to the Allies for quite some time. So at first, the United States declaration of war didn't do much to shift the balance of power. But the U.S. committed troops to the war effort as well, and those troops started arriving in June of 1917 and entered combat that October. In terms of actual troops, the American presence in the war was pretty small in 1917. That first arrival of troops was only 14,000 men. By July of 1918, though, there would be more than a million American troops in France alone. And unlike their counterparts who were already there, these American troops weren't necessarily experienced, but they were fresh. 
Most of the Allied troops who were already in Europe were exhausted after months or years of fighting. So in late 1917, with Russia out of the war and the United States ramping up to join it, Germany recognized that it had a limited window of opportunity. The German military was running out of everything, including people. But with a quick, decisive action, it might be able to force the Allies to negotiate for peace before so many American reinforcements arrived. Or, failing that, Germany might be able to level the playing field, putting it on more equal footing with the Allies during negotiations later on, rather than being at a clear disadvantage. The Allies also recognized that Germany had this one last opportunity to try to break out of the stalemate. So at the start of 1918, Allied leaders were confident that a major German attack was on the way, and soon. But they weren't really sure exactly when or where. It came on the first day of spring. That was March 21st, 1918. German forces attacked a stretch of the Western Front south of the French city of Arras. This was at a point where French and British forces met on the Western Front, and it was the weakest point along that line. Part of the German objective was to cut these two forces off from one another. And then, at least in theory, Germany could fight French and British forces separately, overcoming both of them. The German attack incorporated airstrikes, a massive artillery bombardment, and gas, including tear gas, chlorine, and phosgene, in this attempt to break through the Allied line. And they were immediately successful. The morning they attacked was foggy, and the Allies were caught by surprise. The British 3rd and 5th Armies were forced to retreat, and on March 21st alone, the British military saw 38,500 casualties. That included 21,000 soldiers taken prisoner. Germany was able to advance about four miles, or six and a half kilometers, reclaiming in one day all the ground that they had lost over the previous two years. This March 21st assault was the start of what came to be known as the Spring Offensive, or the Ludendorff Offensive, that was named after Quartermaster General Erich Ludendorff, who was leading the German military with Field Marshal Paul von Hindenburg. In Germany, it was called Kaiserschlacht, or Kaiser's Battle, and the first phase was codenamed Operation Michael. Because it covered some of the same territory as the Battle of the Somme in 1916, sometimes it is also called the Second Battle of the Somme. Operation Michael ended on April 5th, and by that point, the German army had captured about 12,000 square miles of territory. That's about 31,000 square kilometers. This had come at a great cost, though, with about 240,000 casualties that the German army just had no good way to replace. Together, French and British forces, including those from Canada, Australia, and other parts of the British Empire, had suffered nearly 250,000 casualties. Just to be clear, casualty numbers include everyone killed, wounded, or captured. That initial goal of splitting the British and French troops didn't ultimately work out because Germany didn't have the manpower to really divide and fight against both armies. The Allies also quickly realized the threat and united the Allied troops under the command of French General Ferdinand Foch to better coordinate their efforts. So rather than facing an army that was divided and left in chaos, Germany instead faced a force that was united under one command. The overall spring offensive ended on July 15th, 1918, with the Second Battle of the Marne. General Ludendorff tried to capture the city of Rennes, hoping to divide the French forces and set a stage for an assault on Flanders. But unlike on March 21st, General Foch anticipated this attack. He and the Allies mounted a counterattack, and by July 18th, German forces were retreating. Germany could not afford this loss, especially since American troops were now arriving in France at a rate of about 300,000 per month. The 1918 flu pandemic was also sweeping across the globe at this point, including through all of the armies involved in the war. But the war was not over yet, which brings us to Amiens. And we're first going to pause and have a sponsor break before we dig into that. The Spring Offensive and the Allied counterattacks at the Second Battle of the Marne were a shift in how the war was being fought on the Western Front. For years, that had been defined by the trenches. Trenches had been used during battles in one way or another for centuries, and they continued to be a part of warfare after this point. 
But in World War I, they were a side effect of evolving military technologies, specifically machine guns and artillery. Trenches were a way for troops to gain some measure of protection from these devastating weapons, even though it meant that they couldn't really move once they were dug in. During those years of stalemate, an attack on the enemy's trench had usually combined a preliminary bombardment called a creeping barrage with an advancing infantry. The barrage was supposed to lay down artillery just ahead of the soldiers' advance, providing cover and clearing out the opposition. But a lot of the time, this didn't work. Barrages got too far ahead of the troops, effectively serving as an advance warning for the opposite side, or they tore up the terrain so much that the soldiers had trouble crossing to get to the enemy, or barrages might move too slowly or fall short and the advancing infantry were killed as a result. Regardless, though, armies wound up facing huge casualties in exchange for a few yards of territory or none at all. By the spring and summer of 1918, though, World War I's opposing armies were starting to make better use of all the available military technology to effectively assault the other side's trenches. And the Allies' first truly effective use of all that technology was at the Battle of Hommel, led by Australian Corps Commander Lieutenant General John Monash. Monash planned the early morning attack in absolute secrecy. He added smoke shells to the creeping barrage to obscure the battlefield. He also used tanks, which had been introduced in 1916, to plow through the Germans' barbed wire and fortifications and to deliver supplies from behind the infantry advance. Eighteen aircraft were involved as well, including some older ones specifically chosen because their engines were loud enough to cover up the sound of the tanks. The planes dropped bombs and flares providing covering fire and reported back with information about the Germans' positions. The plan also included faking troop movements and using dummy installations to further disguise what they were doing and sending messages back and forth by pigeon. This battle was an enormous success for the Allies. The Allied troops, including American and Australian forces, attacked early in the morning on July 4th, Within two hours, they had obtained all of their objectives. This was really the first time that all of the available military technology had been put into use at once in such a coordinated way. It was so effective that all of the commanders of the British Expeditionary Force got a report about it, detailing what had gone so well after the battle was over. The Battle of Amiens built off these same strategies that Monash had put into place at Hommel. The city of Amiens was a major junction for railroads and communications, and Germany had repeatedly tried to take it during the spring offensive. Germany had not succeeded, but it had stretched out its line in the attempt, creating a bulge that it didn't have the manpower to thoroughly defend. The Allies' attack on the salient was as before, planned in total secrecy. Before it started, they used fake radio transmissions and phony troop movements to disguise their activity during the day while putting the men into their real positions at night. The assault combined air support, artillery, tanks, and infantry. In terms of numbers, the Allies had 75,000 men, more than 500 tanks, and nearly 2,000 aircraft. The troops included British, Canadian, Australian, and French infantry, tank brigades, British cavalry divisions, the Royal Air Force, and American troops that were held in reserve. Australian and Canadian troops formed the spearhead of the infantry attack at Amiens. By this point, Australia's military had distinguished itself as part of the Australian and New Zealand Army Corps, that's ANZAC, in the Gallipoli Campaign, and the Canadian units had developed a reputation as the British Empire's shock troops. Germany was out everything in this battle. Exact numbers are in dispute. It is difficult to track down precise numbers in a conflict like this, but they had a much smaller fighting force with only about 530 guns and 370 aircraft. They had three lines of trenches, but these trenches weren't well fortified, and the communication networks among them were really spotty. When the attack started at 4.20 in the morning on August 8, 1918, it came as a total surprise. Fighting at the Battle of Amiens went on for three days. By that point, the Allies had advanced eight miles. It's about 13 kilometers. They had liberated more than 100 towns and villages from the Germans. 
They'd also captured a 280-millimeter or 11-inch Krupp naval gun that had been used to shell Amiens from about 25 kilometers, or that's 16 miles away. This gun had been mounted on a railway carriage, and the Australian 31st Battalion, 5th Division, captured it by commandeering the carriage and driving it back into Allied territory. They're very proud of capturing this gun. I mean, it's not surprising that they were, (laughs) but it comes up a lot in accounts of this day. After this hugely effective first day, the Allied advance slowed over August 9th through 11th, the German forces started to regroup and offer a stronger resistance, and on the 11th, Sir Arthur Curry of the Canadian Corps convinced General Sir Henley Rawlinson of the British Fourth Army that they should consolidate their gains instead of continuing to try to push ahead against increasingly tougher resistance. But before that decision, the battle had devastated the German army. Ludendorff called August 8th the Black Day of the German Army in the history of the war. He also said that it, quote, put the decline of that fighting power beyond all doubt, and in such a situation, as regards reserves, I had no hope of finding a strategic expedient whereby to turn the situation to our advantage. This wasn't just because of the tens of thousands of casualties that the German army saw that day. It was also that it revealed the terrifically terrible morale among the German troops, At least 12,000 of them were taken prisoner with huge numbers of soldiers surrendering at once. There were even stories of whole groups of Germans surrendering to a single Allied soldier or surrendering even when they had the Allies in that particular spot vastly outnumbered. Altogether, this was the worst German defeat since the start of the war. Until this point, Allied leaders had thought the war would last at least until 1919. But this was the start of the final 100 days offensive that finally ended it. And we're going to talk more about that after we pause for a little sponsor break. After the Battle of Amiens, both General Erich Ludendorff and Kaiser Wilhelm II, the Emperor of Germany, agreed that there was no way for the German army to recover. Their goal became to avoid an outright surrender and the German army continued to fight even as it fell back toward Germany. The Allied forces continued to press ahead in this final push to bring the war to an end. The last major objective to this end was the Hindenburg Line, which was Germany's last large-scale fortification. The Hindenburg Line was a set of three well-defended trenches that had been established in 1917. The Allies planned their assault on the Hindenburg Line for a full month before actually attacking its forward outposts near F.A. France on September 18, 1918. The Allied forces finally breached the Hindenburg Line on September 29th after four days of heavy fighting, including firing nearly a million artillery shells. And at that point, Paul von Hindenburg and Eric Ludendorff told Kaiser Wilhelm that the war was lost. On October 1st, at a meeting of representatives of all the major German political parties, Ludendorff and Hindenburg told the assembled group the reality of the situation. A lot of them were shocked to learn that things were going so badly for Germany. Germany requested peace negotiations on October 3rd. Ludendorff revised his opinion a little later in October, as Allied attacks slowed down to allow the supply lines to catch up to the troops' advance. But by that point... Word of the dire condition of the German military had spread through its civilian population. Like much of the rest of Europe, German civilians had faced extreme hardship during the war, including near-starvation conditions thanks to an Allied blockade. In the face of such grim news, the war just no longer had the support of the German people, especially once he heard... The terms of the armistice, which involved making Germany completely unable to renew hostilities, Ludendorff wanted to renew the fight. But on October 26th, he was forced to resign. By this point, there were rampant desertions going on all over the German military. A massive mutiny also swept through the Navy in late October and early November over orders that they stage an attack on the Royal Navy in an attempt to derail the armistice negotiations. The armistice was finally signed on November 11th, 1918 at 5 a.m., and the war ended at 11 a.m. that same day. The Canadian Corps also liberated the city of Mans, France, that day, which was where the last shot of the war was fired. 
It was also the site of one of the war's earliest battles, and there's actually an episode about that battle in our archive. By this point, Kaiser Wilhelm II had been forced to abdicate and had gone into exile, and German Chancellor Friedrich Ebert had started to form a provisional government. During the last hundred days of the war, French forces saw 530,000 casualties. There were more than 400,000 casualties among the British troops, including the troops from the rest of the British Empire. That's not just from the UK. American forces saw 127,000 casualties. And there were 785,000 casualties just among the Germans, with 368,000 taken prisoner. The German army was also very clearly defeated. After that initial rally in the spring offensive, the tide of the war had turned hard against it. And with millions of American troops on the ground in Europe dramatically increasing the Allies' numbers, there was just no way that Germany could have turned that around. But the false idea spread through the German military that Germany had not been defeated. Instead, this idea took root, didn't take root as though it came out of nowhere. Like, it was intentionally spread that the German army had been stabbed in the back by civilian leaders who negotiated and signed the armistice. According to this mindset, which was spread by Ludendorff and other high-ranking officers intentionally, the officials who signed the armistice were traitors. Adolf Hitler would later brand them the November criminals. This led to a whole conspiracy theory about a betrayal of the German military at the hands of Jews, which became part of Nazi propaganda in the years after the war. The terms of the armistice and the Treaty of Versailles that ended the war also contributed to the run-up to World War II. Under that armistice, Germany had to surrender territory and war materials, including thousands of pieces of artillery, guns, trains, aircraft, battleships, submarines, destroyers, and other naval vessels. Germany was also to surrender its prisoners of war immediately, but there were no reciprocal terms for the other nations to return German prisoners. Under the Treaty of Versailles, Germany was prohibited from joining the League of Nations until 1926. The treaty also drew new borders that gave territory to Germany's neighbors, stripped Germany of its colonies, and required Germany to pay reparations that were economically disastrous. All of this ultimately contributed to Hitler's rise of power, which we talk about in our episode on the Night of the Long Knives. It was a really bummer place to end an episode. (laughs) So uh, if you were listening to this and you were like, this reminds me of Wonder Woman, yes. Uh, obviously, Ludendorff in Wonder Woman is a fictionalized version of this guy uh, who we talked about in this show. Uh, do you also have non-fictional listener mail? No, actually, I have listener mail that's also related to popular culture. This is from Ryan, and Ryan wrote about our recent episode on Libertalia, which Holly actually did all the research and writing for, and Ryan says, Hey, y'all, I love y'all's podcast. I'm just going to take a moment to say I love the word y'all. I've been listening for years, and every time podcast suggestion time comes up, and believe me, I make sure it does, I make sure to recommend Stuff You Missed in History. I listened to the episode about the pirate utopia, Libertalia Today, and you mentioned how it is referenced with a location area of the same name in Fallout 4. I just so happened to be playing through it recently, but I got home, kind of forgot about it, and lo and behold, guess what I stumbled onto while roaming the wasteland? Libertalia, out of the blue, immediately I remembered and proclaimed to my cats, Libertalia. I had to let y'all know, thanks so much for your hard work. Have a wonderful day. Sincerely, Ryan. Uh, Ryan then also sends some compliments to Holly for her show, which is wrapping as we record this. It will all be out in the world by the time this episode comes out, right? That show is drawn. Yes. Story of animation. Yes. Um, We will publish the last bonus episode today while we record, which means by the time you hear this, it will have been in the world for a couple of weeks. At least we're running ahead of schedule in our production. So uh, Ryan says, I've been listening to Drawn and have been so giddy about the show. I'm glad there is such a mutual connection around the medium for those that enjoy it. Animation is such a joy. It truly is magic. Thank you again for all you do. I'm sad that the season is ending. I'm hoping there will be more in the future. I don't want to pressure. Just want to let you know it would be incredibly appreciated. Take care. Thank you, Ryan. 
I wanted to read this email for a couple of reasons. One, it's always fun to get an email about somebody yelling Libertalia to their cats. I mean, I just do that casually around the house. <laughs> <laughs> I look at them and go, Libertalia, and hope that they'll set up some sort of feline utopia where everyone gets a vote, but they never do. They're so lazy. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, there's cats. <laughs> so the, the other reason is that uh, it's come up a couple times on the show before that I've played Fallout 4. I had to put that game down for about 18 months because I was just like, I can't spend my free time wandering around a post-nuclear wasteland for right now. But I got back to it just over the last couple of weeks And I just wanted to share that I stumbled over a weird tourist attraction in that world that is a combination of the Winchester Mystery House and the Lizzie Borden House, and it's amazing. (laughs) uh, If you're playing through some Fallout 4, specifically some Fallout 4 DLC, be on the lookout for that. And if you would like to write to us about this or any other podcast, we're at History Podcast at HowStuffWorks.com. We're also all over social media at the username Missed in History. That's where we're on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and Pinterest. If you come to our website, which is MissedInHistory.com, you can find a, a searchable archive of all the episodes that we have ever done on the show before. You can find the show notes to all the episodes that Holly and I have done together. And you can find and subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts and really anywhere else you want to get a podcast. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit HowStuffWorks.com. 